Remember when pitch offs were all about social apps and camera things, and now we have deep tech, and it's fantastic. And we have one more deep tech company coming out. So from Medford, Massachusetts, we have Electrified Thermal Solutions. Prevent, presenting for Electrified Thermal Solutions is Donnie Smith and Daniel Stack. Give them a round of applause and bring them on out. My name is Dan Stack, co-founder and CEO of Electrified Thermal Solutions. We're working every day to decarbonize the hottest industries with electrified heat. Thank you. So we have a massive problem today. There is no affordable way to decarbonize our heavy industries. Cement, steel, glass, the building blocks of our society all need a tremendous amount of energy. And that energy needs to be cheap, reliable, and hot, often hot as flames. Our zero carbon options today are just one out of the three, cheap. As soon as you try to make them reliable, being cheap is already incredible, but when you try to make them reliable to power, say, a 24-7 cement plant, you 6x the cost, say, if you're making hydrogen, which isn't going to be affordable for society. So we need a new approach to decarbonize our heat. That's why Electrified Thermal Solutions was founded, and that's why we are developing the Jewel Hive thermal battery. This system takes in electricity, from renewables or off-peak nuclear or hydro, whenever it's cheap, whenever it's abundant, whenever it's available, we turn it into on-demand heat stored into the system. We make hot gas with that system, blow air through it, make hot air, and deliver it to your furnace, to your boiler, to your kiln, in place of the fossil fuels you usually burn. And so with this device, we can turn the power from those uh, sources into reliable industrial heat. We can do this Hot as they need, 1800 Celsius, the same as hydrogen, say. But we can keep it affordable, at least three times cheaper than hydrogen. And best of all, we're retrofittable. We can attach to your existing process, pipe in our hot gas to your furnace, your boiler, even your turbine, to give you the energy that you're used to, so you don't have to radically change what you're doing to decarbonize what you're doing. The Joule Hive is unmatched because of a new technology that we've been developing and patenting, and that is the building block of industrial decarbonization the electrically conductive fire brick, or e-bricks, if you like. These bricks are from normal refractory materials, normal bricks that line furnaces today. We use semiconductor doping to make them electrically conductive. The result is a material that can go hotter and last longer than electric heaters today. So we can use this building block in the picture here in green. We stack these up to massive scales to build our dual high thermal battery. And it's three in one. It's a giant electric heater, it's a giant thermal store, and it's a giant heat exchanger that gets the energy out, all built from cheap, affordable, abundant bricks. So this tech is roughly 10 years in the making, mostly during my time at MIT. You can see me here looking very cheery, doing some lab work. Um, and so the system, these bricks had humble beginnings in the wet lab, but ultimately, I had the pleasure of meeting my co-founder, Dr. Joey Cable, and we got to work building out ETS. And we started working with commercial refractory suppliers and fiber suppliers to scale up this technology to what it could be. So we'll go to demo, go live now to our lab in Medford, Mass, just outside Boston, where Joey and our lead uh, test engineer can showcase our progress. So these are some pellets we started out with, just industrial scale, uh, industrial quality powders. We then moved to full-size bricks and aggregates uh, that embellish all of the ways we make bricks. And then we ultimately went to press on half a ton in the past several months, roughly a 1,000x scale up of these electrically conductive bricks. Our test rigs at the lab here are there to test materials properties, but also to run electric heating tests. And here you can see a wattage loading test of a brick conducting the electricity and generating the intense wattages and temperatures that industries need, that our customers need. And then if we go over to our pilot facility, which we commissioned earlier uh, in the summer this year, this is where we stack up full stacks of bricks and electrically heat them up in those configurations we showed earlier. You could see through that window them glowing hot at roughly 1,700 Celsius. And we can emulate the full operating conditions of the Joule Hive in this system for our commercial scale up 
in the next couple of years. All right, thanks, guys. We'll go back to presentation. So from our elevator-sized pilot, we'll be building products soon on the shipping container-sized uh, scale. But ultimately, we're building two tall towers that can put out hundreds of megawatts of heat, which is what our industrial customers need. And we know we can get there due to industrial experience at these scales of stacking bricks. The first product is a few megawatts in, a few megawatts out, and holds 25 megawatt hours. We can put out peak temps of 1,800 Celsius, and we can give you constant temp and constant flow rate as you need at your industrial site. And the goal is to have this on commercial uh, customer sites in 2025 after we demo this next year in 2024. As for where we can deploy, there are areas today where it pays off due to the wind energy coming online that is driving prices very negative across the country, many areas with renewables. This is over the, next, the last few years, electricity prices. We see that in the Midwest, uh, you can operate in areas today where 50% of the year, electricity is cheaper than natural gas as a heat source. We can pay back in five years while offsetting 80% of your carbon emissions. We can't be fossil fuels everywhere yet, but even in regulated utility environments, there are time of use rates where we can absorb cheap electricity and actually give you a three-year payback over your next best option for decarbonization, electric boilers. And we have large customer traction across every major industrial vertical, and these customers are moving through our pipeline towards letters of intent, as well as great government grant opportunities. We are deploying aggressively to two gigawatts and $500 million in revenue per year by 2030. And our ultimate goal is industry electrified by 2045 a dual hive in every furnace, boiler, and power plant, roughly a $3 trillion market. So we're looking to work with industrial partners to reach our vision here. We'd like to decarbonize your sites, especially those who are interested in first-of-a-kind deployments on your site. And of course, we are always a growing team, solving the toughest problems in the hottest space. So please come find us at our booth, go to our website. We'd love you to join our team if you're interested. Thanks so much. Amazing. Give them a round of applause. <laughs> Okay, Libby, do you want to start? Sure. Um, great presentation, thank you. Um, you mentioned that you're not quite competitive with fossil fuels as a thermal energy source yet. Can you describe what you need to achieve within your product uh, to be able to compete? Sure. So in some of those areas, like where the electricity prices are very cheap, we are competitive. Um, ultimately, the price of energy that comes out of these systems is all about the electricity going in. So the box itself and thermal batteries as a technology can be very cheap. Um, but you need to, so we can basically make it as painless as possible to turn that electricity into heat. Uh, but basically, wind and solar have come down uh, majorly in price, and we need to find the spots where they have the cheapest offerings. And that's kind of the major metric there as far as competing directly with fossil fuels. Um, but we're definitely, you know, depending on where you are, definitely at parity, uh, you know, now and in the few decades, like in the few years of this. So, decade. for the solution to be really scalable, you would need to be able to compete with fossil fuels with an offtake price of renewables at around, you know, at a at a standard market price of around maybe four cents a kilowatt hour. Can you talk about how you would measure up to fossil fuels at, you know, a, a PPA price in the range of where you're seeing renewables today, and any advancements you need to make on the technology to be able to compete with fossil fuels at that kind of offtake price? Sure. So. You know, there are PPAs today that are being signed in the, say, $20 a megawatt hour range, 25. And what, you know, what that comes out to, forgetting our system at all, is around $6 per MMBTU. And so depending on where you are and what industrial rates you're paying, you'll see, you know, 5 to $7 per MMBTU. So that price, as a starting point, is in striking distance. Um, so that's for converting the electricity into heat initially, but then it needs to go into your system. There's a capex associated with that. Absolutely. And then... You need to draw the heat out through you right. know, the air so, heat exchanger, right? So our capex adds, you know, a dollar or two of MMBTUs. Um, so you know, we're starting at that solar price of five, six, seven dollars. The thermal storage approach, the dual life thermal battery, can add a couple dollars of MMBTU, but it's a small portion. So even if we drive that to zero, uh, what dominates the you know the levelized cost of energy and the energy that customer experiences is what the electricity markets are doing. But as you saw, we can use off-peak electricity that's negative priced or below their levelized costs and basically do a service to the grid in that way because the grid wants off-takers that are flexible and they'll reward that. So there are opportunities to be below the price of natural gas and we're seeing that now. Thanks. 
Poe, let's go to you. Yeah, I hate to be the guy I always asks a question, will it catch on fire? But hear me out for a second. I, one thing you're portraying here is a kiln, an electric kiln, where the heat itself is acting on the metallurgy. Another one is it's essentially an electric battery where it just runs very hot, and then you're having to turn that battery back into electrons or into work. But how does that work in like an insurance world, where essentially you've got a, a large industrial battery in a facility, and you probably have to separate it. It's like running really hot. How do you, have you been talking to insurers? How do they feel about the safety of this and the non-risk you have? Like one of the things I hate to do is turn on my home oven and I've got electronics in it and I've got an oven running at 500 degrees. Those electronics don't last 18 months. So depending on what you're doing with this work and at the proximity to heat, if you can just help explain how that's managed in your company. Sure, so the electronics are far away from the actual hot spot of, of course. the system. Of course, thank uh, you. And the, the bricks are well insulated in really standard furnace box type of stuff. So from an insurance perspective, from a perspective of, you know, is this risky, is it gonna blow up? This is really not any different from thermal storage, sorry, thermal systems at industrial sites today, right? You know, you go, to, you go to these kilns that are operating at flame temps, the temps aren't unusual. Our materials are already oxide bricks, so they don't oxidize, they don't chemically react. They're less reactive than, you know, virtually any other storage technique yeah. because it's just heat. So the system just sits there hot and that's the risk. As long as you're insulated well, there's no, there's no chemical reaction that could catch fire or something like this. So that's, you know, we consider it one of the safest approaches to storage because this stuff just sits there hot. Um, unlike, say, chemical batteries, for example, where you gotta really pay attention. Libby, do you have another question? Sure. Um, can you describe how you're thinking about your business model? Will you try to sell systems to your customers? Are you trying to provide heat offtake agreements? Definitely. So we're looking at both. Mm -hmm. And what we've been learning is that people will have different interests uh, in both. So, you know, we think it's going to be a mix. Uh, the bigger, more mature industrials that have, you know, energy departments that they can call upon to smartly operate a thermal battery, right? They don't need heat as a service. They can operate as they think makes the most sense. And when they take that ownership of operation, then they, they're gonna get you know, more control and less price up front. Smaller groups who want heat as a service uh, because they don't have that kind of, they, just, they need their heat, they want it zero carbon. Heat as a service is gonna be a better fit for those groups. And what do you feel like is a better fit for you as a business to keep the systems on your balance sheet and provide some sort of uh, like ownership structure that's tied to you guys and then provide offtake of heat or would you prefer to kind of sell full systems to either your customers or a third party? So we expect to be, early on we'll be on balance. Another feature of heat as a service is that way when we install a system that we're building our first of a kinds, people only pay for the heat we give them, right? So on balance, heat as a service is kind of a, a nice thing early. Off balance sheet ultimately is the plan. It's almost like Libby, you worked in the Department of Energy. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you so much. Give them a round of applause. Thanks very much. Well, that was a lot, and I appreciate you sitting here through it, and I hope you enjoyed it. We're going to be back again today in the afternoon with another set of five companies, and then again tomorrow with five more companies. On the last day of Disrupt, TechCrunch Editorial will pick the five finalists, and they'll come present one more time. So we'll see you all again this afternoon. Thank you so much.